Hi everyone, you beautiful people out there. I first of all want to say that today for me is a super special day. And the reason why it's so special is mainly because I have a very special guest. You can almost see her sitting next to me here, but because I don't want Rita to seem a bit silly sitting there just looking at me coming with a monologue here, I'm going to gently remove her just for a second while I'm going to share some thoughts with you by Rita. Um, so <laughs> what is the story of today? Well, today's guest is professor of management and a Colombian business school. And she has published, listen to this, this is crazy. Rita has published 184 times in Harvard Business Review with Post and of course with Artilus. And she is today for sure among one of the top 10 authors of all time on Harvard Business Review. She currently ranks number five on Fingers 50, which arguably is the world's primary ranking of business thinkers in the world. And yes, my guest has been on this list since 2011, as far as I recall, where she in 2013 uh, received the Fingers 50 Strategy Award for the end of competitive advantages. Talk about having a brain with a series here. Now, I brought my guest on board today because um, this show today is about one little thing which is just so silly. And this is today's topic, this remote control. Now, let's wind back time in about two years when I was in Miami at a conference, staying at a hotel, wanted to check the day's headline, I read for this very remote control, right? And it's a remarkable complex, I have to tell you. Uh, it looks a little bit like it could launch a spaceship. Actually, it has infinity, tiny numbers, a multitude of buttons, three separate numerical keypads. Where was the on button? Hey, wait, in fact, it's red, but there's, there's two red on buttons on this one here. So if I press both, would my TV be incredible on, allowing me to access some supernatural programming that viewers with just one button couldn't? And wait, what did source mean? And what did this A, B, C, D mean? Where did all these arrows go? After I just stepped around on this one here for a couple of minutes, and um, then finally the TV came to life and I watched some news for a couple of minutes and then I shut off the television or rather <laughs> I tried to shut off the television but there was two off buttons on this remote control when I pressed the first one the light in this room dimmed in kind of a moody sexy way and when I pressed the second off button the air condition shut off the tv of course I don't need to tell you still was on so I had to climb onto a nearby desk, I'm not kidding, this is crazy, with my butt in the air, pulling out the plug from the wall socket, disconnecting the TV, the mini bar, and of course the standing lamp as well. Now this is really my story, except there's a little twist to my story, because after a few months later, actually, during a flight to JFK, the passenger sitting next to me introduced himself. Now, here's the story. It turns out, purely by coincidence, that he was an engineer at the very same company responsible for this one, right? You probably never heard about the company, he said to me. And I said to him, you want a bit? <laughs> Powering up my laptop, right? Showing him the PowerPoint presentation slide where I had this whole remote control lined up. What the heck went wrong with you guys? I said to him. And it kind of so sort of stiffened his seat. And then he explained that the company had internal problems with various divisions, all desperate to secure real estate on the remote control. Uh, no one really could agree with what departments owned, what real estate. So ultimately, the TV remote control was divided into zones. And, and this is crazy when I'm telling you this, because there was one zone here, which were allocated for TV, a second one was for cable, a third one was for TiVo, and the fourth one for satellite, and then the fifth belonged to the folks responsible, I think, 
for broadcasting big band area or hip hop music 24/7 of I guess for displaying a crackling ukulele lock in the winter with snow or something right <laughs> so this idiot he was so proud of what his company had done and how elegantly had had been sold there's just one issue every division now had fair representation of the remote control except for the fact that i had no idea about how to turn on the television i told him and he kind of looked at me and he really didn't understand how does this over complicated remote control circle back to an absence of common sense in an organization well in my opinion it's very simple uh, as the engineer sitting next to me pointed out the average tv remote control with its logo graphics and scripts and arrows and keys and bottoms and numbers and letters reflect any number of internal miscommunication and power struggles inside this local telecom just as i would say a footprint you know with a small little crack along the side can indicate more serious functional problems well an unintuitive remote control points to a few core problems within the organization within that company that issued it with half a dozen of silos inside this cable company all desperate for representation no one was looking at the remote control holistically that is from a consumer's point of view and that's really my issue today because it brings me back to the very idea of common sense common sense which is by the way a direct correlation with empathy where common sense is seeking things as they are and doing things as they ought to be done empathy is the capacity to understand or feel this is important with the feeling part feel what another person is experiencing from within their frame of reference that is the capacity to place oneself in another person's shoes and yes i know whenever i mention empathy in an organization many people start thinking about crying kids and cupcakes so i don't need to say much more than welcome to the legend of all people which is rita mcgrath and uh, first of all i have to say rita what an amazing pleasure to have you with me on on this show thank you thank you thank you for joining me oh it's a pleasure you uh, i always enjoy my conversations with you martin oh thank you well listen rita let me just first kick off with a quote from a person i know you are huge admirer of now His name is Satya Nadella from Microsoft. He's Microsoft CEO, who said at an internal Musk event I actually was at, and I'm just quoting him right now. He said, "Let's stop uh, the focus on profits and margins. They are lagging indicators. We want to focus on its leading indicators. We want. I want to create a company that customers love. If customers love us, and if customers want to use." what we produce profit roi will come uh, if we don't have customers love these other indicators will not ever happen and i think it's it's so true and i think the best way for me to illustrate that that since satire joined microsoft has noticed that there is an in evolution in what he's thinking in his knowledge and um what i would like to do is to because he's a first ceo tapping into the cup cup word no cupcake word empathy i want to play with you a little video for you which i think is is fascinating and that fascinating video is coming here take a look at this did in a sense of purpose that is renewed every day in our case when we talk about empowering every person and every organization on the planet to achieve more they're not just a set of words for us it's about being able to do the hard work of building technology so that others can build more technology and staying true to that you know across microsoft we're always experimenting experimenting in how can we empower our own employees more for example the annual hackathon we do is a great opportunity for people across the company to get outside of any narrow boundaries we may have set up uh, as organizations so that they can go work on things that matter the most to them personally and to customer needs that they seek and see out there when i think about innovation 
the word that comes to mind for me is empathy. Because if you think about the source of innovation, it's all about being able to meet the unmet, unarticulated needs of customers. And in order for us to be able to do that successfully, you need to have empathy. And to me, empathy is not something you go to work and switch on the button called empathy. It's more about being able to let life teach you how to become more empathetic, how to listen beyond even the words from your customers and partners, and then innovate. And that to me is what drives innovation. Belrita, he's certainly talking about empathy. Um, why is Microsoft talking about empathy? Why are you also concerned about empathy? Share some of your thoughts around empathy and how that at all plays a role in technology, which is almost the reverse. So I think the core idea is that if you think about competition today, we're not really competing in industries, which were very traditionally defined by what technologies they used or what channels they used or whatever. But increasingly, we're competing in arenas, where an arena represents some need, demand, pool of resources with different kinds of people trying to get at, um, at those resources. Now, the way of thinking about this for customers is um, something Clayton Christensen made very popular, which was the jobs to be done idea. And uh, he and Tony Olwick kind of developed this idea jointly, which was customers don't do business with you because they want to. You know, nobody in the world gets up in the morning and says, great, today I get to drag, you know, in the case of shaving, cold steel across my face, or fantastic, today I'm filling out my credit card form. I mean, nobody ever does that. Um, so customers do business with you because there's a job they want to get done in their lives. And this is where it connects to empathy because empathy allows you to see past what it is you're doing and see what it is that the customer is trying to achieve. And what we find is, and I love your work because you just point out, so many of these ridiculousnesses. So can I can I match your, your remote control story here? So I had a box of books that were signed that I was going to send to a client. And so I got the you know, federal address number, the address of the client, the all the everything you would need to, to, to get a box from my house to where the client was. Um, and I had it on a piece of paper and the FedEx guy dutifully rings the doorbell. I hand him the box and he looks at it in absolute horror. And he says, it doesn't have a label. And I said, well, okay, um, you know, go to your truck and I'm happily fill out a label if that's what you need. He says, well, I don't carry labels on my truck. And I'm thinking to myself, so I'm the only person in the entire history of Federal Express who has ever tried to ship a box without the appropriate label. Um, and so then I said to him, well, how, how would I go about getting a label? And he says, well, um, we could overnight you one. He said very earnestly and helpfully. And then, and then he said, I think you can go on the internet. And then he left me in my box standing forlornly there. Now, the reason I think this is so characteristic of what you write about in your book is that I am sure if you sat the FedEx people down, they would say, our job is not to create a really frustrating customer experience for you. They would say, well, we've got to have the label because that's where you know the delivery people connect to the operating people, connect to the financial system, connects to the billing system. I mean, the label is where it all comes together, right? And we have to have that. Does your customer care? No. So if you were to look at that transaction through the customer's eyes, I mean, you would have like, um, if you needed to, a mini little printer in the back of the truck or somebody who had thought ahead of time about printing a FedEx label, doing your you know administrative work for you, uh, you know, could have had it solved on the spot. So I think that's illustrative to me of these incredibly sophisticated systems. And FedEx is you know it's a marvelous company. They, they they're wonderful, and I'm poking fun at them a little bit because it's just such an obvious miss at the at the point of interaction with the customer. Right now, um, if I had really 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 needed to get that box out the door that day, what would I have done? put the box in my car, driven off to UPS. They don't bug me about labels. I just hand the thing to them and write a check and we're done. Um, and you know that could have changed my buying behavior forever and nobody at Federal Express would ever have known. It's the issue we have here because for you and I being customers, it's extraordinary obvious, right? <laughs> no, I, 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 I'm quoting a term here, which is called Kulturbrillen, which is a German term, which really is directly translated with the idea of culture glasses, seeing the world from only your point of view. And I think we're really, really good at seeing it from our own point of view, if we are executives, and we kind of have this naive feeling of what uh, the customers want. But most of the stuff we hear about is through numbers, where there's not a lot of emotions attached to it. Mm -hmm. 
what give me some thoughts about how do you drag those senior folks into a mindset of a customer so they experience that FedEx experience or the remote control experience? Right. So I think the first principle is something I talk about in, in my book, Seeing Around Corners, which is about strategic inflection points. And um, the the thing that a strategic inflection point does is it makes a 10x change occur to something you've taken for granted uh, about your business. So, you know, any business grows up with a set of constraints and a set of opportunities and a set of possibilities. And as you develop a success formula, you you hone those, you improve them, you develop KPIs, you learn what works. And so when an inflection point passes through, what that often means is that some constraint is removed or some new constraint is imposed. But if you're still operating with the lens of the old ideas, it's almost impossible to see them. So what I advise senior leaders to do is, uh, I call it snow melts from the edges. So you've got to have practices for getting out to the edges to see that shock when the customer doesn't get their need met or understand why they're abandoning their baskets midway through an internet transaction or, you know, Look at how a 10 year old is reacting to your products and services because, you know, one thing you know is in 10 years, those are going to be the 20 year olds of the future, right? So um, it's really that, that making the time to personally experience what's going on with your customers, what's happening. And I think one of the dilemmas senior leaders face is the more senior you get, you know, the harder it is to get really good information about what people really believe and what they're really feeling. Absolutely. And listen, I, I just want to go back to seeing uh, around the corners because that's the title of your latest book. And I think that you and I are sharing editor. I think it's Rick Wolf, which sadly has left the publishing house now, but which with a guy. Now, what's fascinating about this is that I believe that the original title was gradually, then suddenly, right? And just like Hemingway's comment about how did you go bankrupt? Well, gradually, then they land on your doorstep, then very urgent, and then it seems to have come out of nowhere. But if you really study them, the seeds have been there for a long time. So I open today's show with this insane story about the remote control, of course, and talk a little bit about my metaphor with this little crack in the bricks as a metaphor. And I guess that seeing around the corner is the ability to see the uh, cracks in the bricks before it's too late. Can you give me an example about someone in senior management which noticed those cracks ahead in time in smart ways um, and actually managed to save the company? Sure. So um, a couple of examples that I write about in the book and that I'm very enthusiastic about are um, one is a not very well-known company, uh, you know, although it's a, quite a dominant company in Finland called UPM, which originally stood for Universal Paper Mills. And their senior team, who've been in place for a remarkably long period of time, you know, just looked at the world around them and they said, you know, printed paper would you know, probably not growth industries for the future. And so they dug right down and they said, what are we uniquely good at? And one of the things they concluded they were uniquely good at was uh, enzyme technology. Because if you're taking wood pulp and turning it into paper, you, that's something you really need to, to learn about. In addition, you know, that's a very environmentally damaging process. So they said, we also want to be really better at that. And uh, they split the company. They said, we're going to take you know, half of the company that really understands enzyme technology and we're going to have them look for new opportunities. And the existing company that does, you know, two by fours and paper mills and stuff like that, they're going to be um, you know, working on the traditional business. And of course, I thought this was a terrible idea when they first told me about it. Um, and so the, the, the CEO sort of says with a, uh, sort of an impish grin, he says, well, why don't you go talk to the guys in the core business? And I just thought they'd be demoralized and upset and horrible. Nothing like it. Nothing like it. They were like, oh, yeah, yeah, we're running this business, but we are like Rambo. You know, we are protecting the fort while those bio fior people get their act together. And what he'd done that was very human and very explicit was he had, he had included them in the conversation, firstly. Secondly, he said, look, by the time these people working with blank sheets of paper and figuring out the science and all that, by the time, by the time they get to be running a mature business, we're going to need your skills. We're going to need your skills and operate precisely and operate with safety. I mean, these are pretty heavy duty markets they're getting into. And today they're a huge player in the energy industry. They've gotten into biodiesel. 
Uh, they're global, all over the place. Um, and to me, that's an interesting example of, of, of sort of centering a company, yes, on capabilities, but also on where are these growth markets in the future going to be? And we know renewable energy is both an environmental mandate and, and a you know, user benefit. What an amazing an example. I, I, I love it. Now, listen, before we move on, I just want to give a shout out to all the viewers across the world. By the way, do me a favor, post a note about who you are, what your name is, and what country or what city you're from. And I have quite a lot of notes here. I have a hello to Michael, Ines, and Tuna says hello, and Henrik and Joanne says hello. Marcus asks, how do you design engaging multi-sensory experience in e-commerce, business developing, physical goods? My God, that's a cost question I do want to cover tomorrow, I think. So is it okay, Michael? And what are the three brand fundamental businesses should incorporate to help them achieve their business objectives? And I want to just address this question very quickly. In my opinion, uh, and, and Rita, I want you to, to uh, come with some input here, is the three brand objectives. For me, I want to tell you a story. Uh, so when uh, you are looking at some of the most powerful brands around the world, you actually can boil down the entire brand to just one word. So let's just try a game here. Rita, I want to try a game with you. I'm now going to tell you just one word and you have to guess what company it is, right? Oh, goodness. <laughs> That's going to be a challenge. All right. Let's see. You ready? What sure. about the word search? Search, well, Google, obviously. Yeah. There we go. See, you're pretty good at it. Now we're going to go into the car industry and I'm going to say safety. Uh, Volvo. There we go. See, that's not difficult. No. So do you know, Rita, how they actually managed to secure the ownership of the word safety at Volvo? Do I know the history? I don't. So this is what's so fascinating. And this comes back to what I'm I'm trying to answer to, to our friend here. Volvo in 1959 was the first car company in the world to employ a guy from the Swedish Air Force. And this guy actually employed the idea of the three-point seat belt. So they actually were the first to invent that very concept. Later on, they were the first to have the airbag in the side, the 24-7 light on it. The, the Also, I still hate them for this, they were the first to invent the seat belt alarm, okay? But... What I'm saying here is that they have been focused on safety all the time. They never said that the safest car in the world. They always let you uh, basically make that, draw that conclusion yourself. And this is, I think, a very important advice if you asked about branding as this guy is doing it specifically, that you should own one word. And then you should create propriety aspects around it which are constantly supporting that focus and make sure you acquire the right talent to combine two ordinary things in a new way, which is exactly what Volvo did, taking people from the Air Force and bring them into to the industry of cars, right? So this was a little bit of a side rail here. I'm sorry about that, Rita. But I just want to go back to you for a second because I find this conversation fascinating. Now, when Leco asked me back in the mid-90s to develop their global strategy. I recall thinking about this for quite some time, and later on I suggested four simple words. Quit, plastic, go digital. And then, by the way, I was fired, just so you know. So what happened then was that um, I was rehired some time later, and the reason why I thought this was very important st you know, statement was because, of course, today, as we know, plastic is a huge problem. Lego is going to be sustainable very soon, but also it was a, my way to kind of force them to see themselves outside the physical plastic toy as computer gaming was coming into the game. And I know for a fact you've said a lot of interesting stuff about it, and I'm going to play a little clip here which is really thought-provoking. Take a look at this. So let's say you've come to a conference like the Drucker Forum, you say, wow, you know, I really need to think about the future. What does the future hold for my business? So let's do a little thought experiment. Imagine to yourselves that you are Mr. Sony Walkman at the height of that business's success. And so you call up R&D and they send a delegation and they tell you, guess what? In the future, no more AA batteries. No more worrying gizmos. In fact, no more albums, no more media. It's all going to be songs, and they're going to fly through the air and land on your hard drive. Oh, and one last thing. The music they reproduce is going to be less high quality than the music we can make with our current technology. 
you could be forgiven for saying, you know, please go back to R&D where you can do minimal damage, right? I mean, that's a very scary prospect. So we've got to have some way of freeing resources from being trapped in the existing businesses and getting it to where they need to fund the future. What an amazing story. I just absolutely loved it. I just want to hear, <laughs> I noticed how you used what I call a predictive technique, predicting things from another angle to make people wake up. Is this approach you often use in order to make people wake up? Or what do you do to shake that tree? Well, there's a, actually a, a process you can use, um, which is described in the book. Um, but it's basically you envision two major uncertainties that are important to your organization, whether it's a business or whether it's a not-for-profit. Um, so, you know, and there are a number to choose from, right? So let's take uh, the pharmaceuticals um, and one big issue is going to be well, how does telemedicine fit the healthcare model of the future and they're legitimately very different points of view one point of view is once we're past the pandemic and things settle down again we're going to go back to in-person doctor visits and that's going to be the high standard of care and yet there's a whole other point of view which says well no actually we've learned in the course of this pandemic that an awful lot of health care can be delivered very effectively at low cost in a telemedicine informed way. So whether that's a phone or a video or a Zoom or whatever it is. Um, and if you, if you then say, okay, well, there's two, that's two ideas about the future. And then we overlay another uncertainty on top of that. So let's say another uncertainty is something about the way pharmaceuticals are traditionally priced, you know, but with the advent of, of, of a lot of pressure on cost in the healthcare system, that there's going to be a lot more requirements for transparency, there's going to be a lot more, you know, less ability to kind of hide how profits are made and so forth, and or, or not, right? And so by, by laying those two on each other, you get four distinct futures. And what I think is really important, Martin, is it's not about predicting right? It's it's about preparation. It's about mental, mental preparation. So I think the first breakthrough that I often have with senior teams is when I can get them to say, hey, these are all plausible next stages, right? Then you can work backward and say, well, if these are all plausible, what are some of the things we can or should be doing today to keep an eye on them? You know, so, so we, we, we sort of say before that can be true, what are the things we must be able to observe? And secondly, then to make sure that we're prepared strategically, that we're not caught by surprise by some change that, you know, with the wisdom of hindsight, we should have been able to uh, look to. So I'll give you an example of one really in the pandemic that I've been working on. Um, and I did this exercise with the following uncertainties. One was that we would be you know, keeping the social contract, the allocation of resources in society fairly stable the way it is now, or that we would see a real sea change where, you know, the population is demanding a new social contract, better treatment for workers, more widely available access to, you know, goods like housing and education and healthcare. Um, and, and would that be the case? And then the other dimension was what's going to happen with the economy? Are we going to see a really vigorous rebound or are we going to see a case where at least parts of the economy continue to really, really struggle. And if you put those two together, um, you get four scenarios, one of which I call a miserable, which is you know, same old, same old, but you know, the economy really not doing well. And we know that's not a good place to be. <laughs> like you're gonna see con conflict over resources, increasing divisiveness, possible violence. You know, we've already seen evidence of that. Uh, the next scenario is kind of, you know, rinse and repeat more of the same, but not real progress on a social dimension. But then in this idea where we've got actual political will for something along the lines of a new social contract, but we have a wounded economy. I call that um, a return to FDR's rendezvous with destiny scenario. And then of course the sunniest of all is, you know, kind of better social contract, fairer treatment for more people, uh, and the economy you know, takes off again. There what we see is, I call that you know, Great Society 2.0. Now, when I first started building these scenarios back in February, March, you know, right around the beginning of lockdown pandemic, any one of those four could have been true. So what I was telling senior executives was, you know, you need to think about how you're going to respond to each of these possible futures. And so here we are today. It's now what is it's January 2021. We've got a new administration in, and they've even in the first day or two very clearly signaled that they really want to take that new social contract forward. 
Um, and the stock market is going crazy. They're saying, this is going to be great. You know, money's going to go into the economy. We're going to see it uh, really flowing. So you have one of those very interesting inflection points, which is leading to a, quite a new um, landscape in which policy and business needs to be done. The other thing I think that has been a big learning in this in this pandemic and in this social and political moment we've been in is that business leaders should have a point of view. You know, they're they're they they can't just be you know unemotional arbiters of of the resources of society. There are there are things that are demonstrably useful and good to have. And one of the things I'm very uh, drawn to is uh, after the Second World War, business leaders actually said, you know, part of our role is to create good jobs and to create stable societies because that undergirds a stable middle class, which in turn makes a better environment for business. And I think what we're starting to see is a number of leaders beginning to recognize that this, you know, all the resources for shareholders is not necessarily going to create the stable, richer future that we would all prefer to see. No, I fully agree with you. In fact, it's funny because one of the viewers right now, Dirk, is asking, um, what, what do you do to plant a seed of a need for transformation? What is the way you sort of start that movement going on so senior management now realize, okay, this is the moment? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think it has to start with some point of view about the future that says, you know, we act or we're going to be left behind. And I'll give an example, because I think it's easier to understand if you take examples. Um, so the company is Klockner, which is well known in Germany, but not so well known outside the company. They're a very large uh, metals distribution company. And they found themselves locked in just a horrible death spiral of, of you know, a bad structure for their industry, the chronic oversupply and the big steel makers, you know, a, a value chain that was really fragmented and very full of inefficiency and customers not happy with anything, you know, just, just it's, it's sort of a very unhappy place to be. And their leader, uh, Gisbert Rule, looked around and he said, you know, digitization has affected more and more and more of the world. We think we need to go digital. And I think that's going to be really important. We need to create platforms. We need to go digital. We need to figure out some way of, of addressing this in our supply chain. And he looked at their, their value chain, right? And they were still sending faxes to each other. Customers, you know, when office hours were not there, they would literally fill out a fax and send it in and then the order would be filled. And so his first effort was internal. Um, they tried to, you know, come up with some things just, just themselves. And he realized, you know, not anything bad about the people that are in the existing business, but again, they're they're so informed by the lens of what is, it's just hard to get them to be on that. So he took two engineers. He started a little tiny little sub company in uh, Berlin, uh, and he called, they called it Klockner IO. And their mandate was to do something anything that made life easier for customers. He said, I don't care what you do, but the only requirements are it's got to make us better for our customers and it's got to be digital in some way. So the first thing they did was they tackled the fax problem. So now instead of having to fill out a fax form, the customer could do it, you know, online, which, you know, in the year, what was it, 2014 or 15 that they started this, it does, that does not sound like a revolution. But here's what's interesting. Um, so they, they automated the fax. And before this change, when the fax had hit the boundary of the company, you know, people took down all the information and then they went and fulfilled the orders and then responded to the customer and so forth. So the electronic order hits the boundary of the company. Absolutely nothing changes behind. But it's a better experience for customers. So the next thing they started was they said, well, maybe we can digitize the stocking system, you know, come up with electronic order parts. Now the thing hits the boundary of the bidding and the people behind it sort of go, oh, this is better. Now I know that that particular good is on aisle four, you know, shelf 22 it makes my life easier and so they created a really transformed digital organization and today they have a complete build out platform which goes all the way from things where you could buy them on amazon or you could buy them from Klockner, all the way through to very very uh evolved and sophisticated services but they've also launched a platform for the industry as a whole which has been tried many times and has never worked many many times and gisbert rule is actually going to leave Klockner in may and take over as the executive director of this this newer platform the other thing he's going to try to be doing is he really wants to create something like this connection between Klockner and the the Berlin people, you know, between the new and the old, um, for the Mittelstand in, in Germany. And I think that's so interesting because what he will tell you is, you know, the old has value. That's where the expertise lies. That's where the scientists are. That's where the engineers are. That's where that deep, deep technical knowledge lives. So it's not that they have no value. It's that 
you know, they are in the lens of what was. And so what we need to infuse it with is a connection to the new, to where the new things are coming. And it's getting that balance right that I think is the real magic. It's absolutely spot on what you're saying. It's it's very interesting because it's very similar to, I'm sure you may be familiar with one of my philosophies, the one I'm writing about in, in, in the new book, which is the chicken cage syndrome, mm -hmm. an experiment done with chickens. They were put into a cage and stuck into the cage for half a year. And one day they were let out on the beautiful green grass and they went out and the birds were singing and everything was perfect. And then they went straight back in again after 30 seconds. And I call that the chicken cage syndrome. And the reason why I'm telling you that is because what I've learned is if you imagine you have four chicken cages and they're standing around a square and you have to place a piece of corn to kind of get these chickens out of the cage, what would you do? Now, most leaders typically would place the corn straight in the middle, but the distance will be too big. It'll be too long term. The KPIs are not supporting it. What if my manager is being fired and I look like a fool, right? So one of the things I've learned, which is really what you're saying, is to place the corn straight outside the chicken cage so they can take it very easily, they can get a success, and all the other chickens are looking, my God, look at this beautiful little corn, and they're all doing it, and then another corn, another corn. And that's really, we're really saying the same, just with two different stories. Is, is that true? Absolutely. So one of the things I like to suggest to people is, you know, the way to meet a disruptive challenge is not necessarily with a disruptive response. You know, the way to meet a disruptive challenge is to successfully learn what what you need to learn. So, I mean, one of the other things, Martin, that I think is really important when it comes to this whole question of empathy and getting into your customer's eyes is right now we're all facing a level of uncertainty that I don't think anybody in my living memory has faced. You know, we, we don't know what's going to happen with the pandemic. We don't know what's going to happen with government policies. We don't know what's going to happen with climate change. I mean, we have these really existential issues that we're all grappling with. And here's the thing. It is entirely possible to be a senior leader in a very large corporation and never ever have had to deal with those kinds of uncertainties. So here's the good news. The good news is the tools that come from innovation where you've always had uncertainty and you've never had facts to go on and you haven't had a platform of experience because it's never been done before. Those tools of solving successive problems to get to new solutions, the toolkit exists. You can put it to work. It's got its own kinds of KPIs and things. And what people don't realize is it's all there. Right. And so they go off into this world and they try to invent it from scratch. And of course, a lot of mistakes. And as you said, concerns about careers and am I going to cost my promotion and so forth. So I think the encouraging thing is it's it's there if you want to teach yourself about it. And uh, and there's a lot of great work by people like uh, Steve Blank and Alexander Osterwalder and myself, the whole uh, Gina O'Connell uh, who and, and, and Gina O'Connor. And, you know, a lot of people have actually spelled all this out. So the, it's there for the taking. It's just as you said, it's like. If I've spent my whole life in that in that cage, in that surrounding, it's very strange to look at this completely other discipline. And listen, is it okay I'm quoting a very famous and, and a person which really knows what she's talking about? I'm just going to put a quote up here. Particular quote here, I'm just see. Generating ideas. Well, you can read the quote yourself. <laughs> Generating ideas is not a problem. Incubation is, acceleration is. And that's really, I think, the essence of what you're saying. That's where we have the, the issue. Rita, it's been such a pleasure to have you on my little show here. Uh, if people are going to find you, where do they find you besides jumping on a plane and visiting you? <laughs> <laughs> well, you're not even allowed to do that. Um, yeah, Readingmcgrath.com is a really good place to start. I have a monthly Thought Spark newsletter that I publish every month. It's free. You can just log, log right on on the website and uh, see it. I do uh, weekly Friday, Friday fireside chats. And in fact, Martin, I believe we're scheduled to have you as one of our guests, which I'm really looking forward to. Those are recorded. They're on YouTube. So if you go to my YouTube channel, you can see all of those. There, there's no charge for them. Um, and then obviously books. So there's lots, lots of ways to connect to Rita World. <laughs> Beautiful. Thank you so much. And listen, I think the best way to say this is you have worked with technology since you started to be on your typewriter, I believe, in 1977 when you were 18 years old, where your mom forced you to learn typewriting. Well, my dad did the same when I was 15 years of age. It's forced us to adopt 
new ways of thinking while also have one leg in stability. And it's that very intriguing combination between two different worlds, which I think is our sweet spot. So I just want to say thank you so much. Thank you. Now, I'm going to move on by saying that um, tomorrow I have Charlene Lee on this very line. Charlene Lee, you know, from Groundsville. Uh, a book which actually was launched almost at the same time as biology was launched. I believe that was back in 2008. She's also a New York Times books in total. She's done TED Talks. I believe she's part of Thinkers 50 as well. And she's a wonderful person talking about the disruption of technology. And I'll tell you one thing with Charlene and I. We had a really heated discussion a couple of months ago. I think it was in San Diego about how empathy works and if you can create empathy through technology or not. She was very adamant about that you could, and I was very adamant about you couldn't. So this is going to be pretty funny to see what the reaction is going to be. So with that, with no further ado, I'm going to say thank you so much. It's tomorrow at 7 p.m. Central European time, 1 p.m. GMT, and I believe that will be around 10 a.m. Pacific time. Take care, everyone. See you. Bye for now. Thank <laughs> you.